No funciona? No. Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, just um, quick information that this afternoon we're going to hear two sessions in Portuguese, so starting with this first one. So you may pick up headsets if you need to listen to English from the back of the auditorium. Um, and there's also headsets available for anyone who may wish to listen in Spanish. For those of you listening on Zoom, you may also select your language by enabling the interpretation feature. Click the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select your preferred language. Uh, you may also select the words that say mute original audio feature to avoid hearing the other language at the same time. Um, so we're going to start the afternoon with a conversation with the artist Nilsson Baniwa. And because um, you know, there's people that haven't been able to see the exhibition. I wanted to start by giving you some information on what he has done in the, in the show. I'll be short because I know that you want to listen to him. Um, but Denilson Baniwa is a member of the Baniwa Indigenous Group who live in the state of the Amazonas in Brazil. In his territory, there are 23 indigenous groups, each with their own cultures and languages. He currently lives in, resides in Rio de Janeiro, and he has been part of exhibitions at Pinacoteca de Sao Paulo, Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, Museo de Arte de Rio, and the Sydney Biennial. As I have already explained, I decided to invite Nielsen to insert his voice in this exhibition with the idea of countering the European view in our GRI collections. Through the run of the exhibition, I have been asked on several occasions why I decided to work with the Nielsen. Apart from being a brilliant artist, another important reason is that he was already working with colonial and 19th century materials. And I'm just going to show you three, uh, four images uh, from his previous work, where you can see his use of historical pieces in which layering different elements is an important part of his practice. Uh, the Nielsen generates changes in the original works, adds elements, replaces titles, adds works and sentences, as you can see in all of these images. The idea was that you would encounter the Nielsen's work in every section of the exhibition as a constant voice that makes you rethink the materials that you're looking at. In order to do that, he created several interventions into objects from our collections, four murals based on our materials, two video art pieces, and an installation with a mural and a cabinet of curiosities. This is the beginning of the show where you can see how he welcomes you with uh, that sentence at the top. And there you see the first mural, which has the, um, the map of, of America with some of his writing on top and some erasure too. This is another of his murals with the allegory of America. And this is him with uh, the mural um, that is the image of the show. Um, using his own words, Danielson wants to provoke a reflection on the historical process of colonization of the Americas. His work brings a provocation that sometimes is to add information to certain documents or extract information from other documents or even produce different documents where he can tell an untold story about colonization, of course, from an indigenous point of view. He wishes to create a new narrative where he feels included, and to do that, he deconstructs the narrative using the colonization documents themselves. And here are some other interventions on our actual objects. Uh, this is the book by Abraham Ortelius, where you can see how he cut out different parts. You can only see the elements that he wants you to see. He also changed the title of the, the piece. It's now titled Therapy for All. Uh, this is another work that he did that is similar to the other one. Um, Nicolas showed this piece in, in his presentation. And you can see that he also changed the, the title of the piece. This is uh, Historia Natural de la Colonización. This is another work that was also shown uh, before um, where he added a layer. And, and so you can see that he transformed the Spaniards into dogs. And he talks about this idea of um, or karma, 
um, it's, it, they have a word, uh, the Baniwa culture, they have a word that relates to our own idea of karma. And this is another intervention that he did to an allegorical figure of America, where he added this mirror that distorts the image of, um, of America. And at the same time, he speaks about the idea how for the Vaniwa people, there are these little figures that inside they have spirits trapped. And what he was doing with these interventions was to release the spirit of America. And the spirit of America will be an alligator. And the alligator is a very important animal for the Vaniwa people because they brought um, light and fire to them. And you can see that another thing that he did was to also intervene the labels. Uh, he added information, he added his name, he changed titles. Um, he also created this other work where you, if you put it in front of the book, you'll see Juan Ambeck talking to you, telling, to, telling you that your America is a colonial fiction and that you are in a stolen territory. Uh, this is the, one of the video art pieces that he created in relationship to the objects that are below the video, which are about uh, the modern um, techniques that were invented during the 16th century, uh, including the printing press, which is from the 15th century, but he uses that in, in his video. Uh, this is the other video that he created, which is another, it's a performatic piece done in Manaus, where he's uh, creating a map, uh, a map that at the center has Hipana, which is the center of the universe for the Vaniwa people. And this is the mural that he created at the end of the show that has uh, the story of the creation from the Vaniwa perspective. And in front of it is a, um, his idea of um, cabinet of curiosity with all these elements that he brought from the Amazon. And of course, he also added information and changed the meaning of these objects. Um, so now I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna talk to the Nilsson. Fernanda is going to uh, guide the conversation because it's gonna be in Portuguese. So let's, let's sit there. Olá a todos e todas. Hello, everybody. Denilson, thank you for being here with us. I think we can start asking you to speak a little about your trajectory, how you became an artist, how this process came about, and uh, how that uh, is uh, fits within your life trajectory. First of all, thank you very much, Fernanda Pita, for being on this conversation. Thank you very much for the invitation in, first, in the first place, and then for all the uh, monitoring and helping me with the process of work until we could finally open this exhibition and now we'll start the uh, dialogue with the public about my uh, this work so i'm very grateful to you for this partnership well i am natural of a region in the amazon in the brazilian amazon bordering colombia and venezuela in Brazil and within this territory, there are 23 different indigenous peoples and uh, which comprise a great cultural complex. So I started to be part of the indigenous movement at, in that area where I could learn about uh, access politics and rights politics that Brazil had toward indigenous peoples. At the same, that same time, I had access to the first indigenous artist, contemporary indigenous artist, who is dear to me and special to me until today. And this week, I was thinking about this a lot. Some people influenced me, uh, and when I to become an artist, and uh, 
Jose Ulana is an artist of the Versana people in the area where I was born, is the first indigenous artist that uh, I contacted and uh, will influence me for the rest of my life. But in the 90s and early aughts, although I like to draw and paint and, and tell stories through drawings, I didn't have any pretension of being an artist. My life was dedicated to be part of the indigenous movement in the struggle for the rights of my people and my community up to that point. Even creating a lot of uh, works of art, I didn't have the interest of uh, becoming an artist or have that as a career. In 2015 and 16, I was invited to be part of uh, an exhibition in Rio de Janeiro called, called Jaguataporã. And that was the first exhibition where I could see indigenous people being invited as artists. And that moment was uh, very uh, important for me because that's when I had uh, uh, an epiphany of what I wanted to do with my life. So I left the uh, uh, indigenous movement and I decided to dedicate myself exclusively to artistic pr production, not only artistic production, but also about theories about art and exercise of thinking of what uh, art history would look, look like uh, based on indigenous peoples. And when I was doing research for that work, I ended up developing what I do today, which is a work at the same time intellectual of thinking about indigenous art and a, a work that thinks about developing new points of view from do, based in, on documents and colonial documents and uh, works of art. That's where I am here now as an artist who thinks about indigenous production in Brazil and thinks about how rewriting colonial documents is important. Thank you, Denilson. It's very important remind that uh, people that your trajectory in the uh, indigenous movement and your uh, being an artist is uh, an attempt to conquer, conquer other spaces so that this activism keeps happening. I think you left the movement, but the movement did not leave you. It's right there in your path. We wanted to ask you a little bit about your relationship with this place, where you come from, from which you are removing yourself in this uh, path where you left uh, the area to come to the southeast of the country and uh, start living in Rio de Janeiro and starting to have this relationship with the world of art that's established uh, within these places. But some of your works or recent works, we would like to uh, talk about your, uh, there was a participation of you at the Frestas Exposition in Sorocaba in 2021, where you show an installation called Nyobri, which shows exactly your strong or intense relationship with your people, especially with your family and with this place where you come from. And I think that the work that you do here too at this exhibition talks about this constant reflection as well about your uh, transit and your belonging to that place. How do you see that in your work? How it is for you to talk about that place that is yours, where you come from? And we would like also to ask you if you are developing other projects that uh, are building this bridge. 
We're going to show an image from the Frestas installation. Yeah. Você quer comentar um pouquinho? Would you like to say something? Yes. Since the beginning of the uh, SARS-CoV-19 pandemic, I've been thinking about my position on the world and what it is that I want to do as an artist that could communicate to the world, to Brazil, the place where I come from. And this is, has a lot to do with the fact that I finally recognize the position where I find myself in this moment. When I moved down to the Southeast, right after the demarcation of the last indigenous reservation in Brazil, it was demarcated, which changed completely the uh, official uh, recognition policy by the state of recognizing indigenous peoples in Brazil or lands in Brazil, and a lot of violence came out of that institutional violence with the Brazilian state who forced indigenous people from the movement to go back to their communities or exile themselves in different areas. So I find out myself a little before COVID-19 spread throughout the world. I understood myself as an exile from my territory in Rio de Janeiro because it was in Rio escaping the violence from the uh, uh, settlers that were attacking people in, within this demarcated territory in Roraima. And I identified with this position of being an exile and I started to think about what I was doing as an artist in order to communicate my territory. And at that place, I started to think or, or remember who I am and where I come from, who is part of my place, where I belong. And when in 2020, COVID started, I began to become concerned with the history of my people and my community, my family, a little afraid for the older the elders of my community to pass away and i had never talked to them about uh, certain historical facts uh in the area miromi is a realization of a old dream of mine of talking with uh, to my uh, great grandmother who passed away in 2015 and i never talked to her about her life story. She used to tell me stories about the people, the cosmology, but her personal history, it was a trauma. We were, She was traumatized, we could never talk about that. And I had the intention of uh, recording her, uh, talking to her and recording in order to, to create this family memory. I did not have this chance with COVID-19 then I decided to go back and, and talk to my grandmother, who is the oldest in the family and knows the stories of my family since they left the traditional territory to the other territory where we live today. And that was uh, became very strong for me because also I had, I could help my community through my works of art today as an artist I I can start the uh, bilingual Baniwa school, help my community and other communities as well with the works of art only. So, but when I go back, my mother does not know what a work of art is. She doesn't understand what a museum is, what decolonization is. She doesn't know these things. And I was thinking, what does make sense then for here? Because my work as an artist is reverberating in this place, which is my community. So I have, uh, I have been focused, very much focused in going back to do the work, become or make the work become part of the community. More recently, I've been doing a series of uh, drawings, 
they have to do with the historical process of my family, as well as other families in the area where I was born. Historical processes that have to do with the slavery, with the arrival of the Catholic Church, the missionaries and the region. And that has a lot to do with the uh, another indigenous artist, Senyulana. My most recent work has to do with uh, my family's removal and as well as other families removal to work as a slave labor building the city of Manaus, which is capital of the state of Amazon. And now in November, I am going to back to my area to uh, act realize one of the dreams of uh, the artist uh, Lana creating a museum where he can think an indigenous museum of dreams that will keep the memory of the peoples of that region. It's an art, it's an artistic exercise. It's an intellectual inter exercise thinking new constructions as artists as Baniwa as originals of that territory and all that has to do with the history of a traditional occupation and contemporary of my territory it gets what i brought and what i wanted to remark is uh, how the culture of the black people where I was born oh i'm sorry the negro river was where it was born uh, is spread throughout museums in um, the Americas and Europe. And uh, they keep part of the history of my family, and my territory. And a lot of these objects today don't even exist anymore because after the prohibition uh, by the Catholic Church, they didn't exist anymore or prohibition by the state of the cultural self-sustenance of that area. And I also bring a bit of uh, Baniwa culture telling how the territories are so important to, for maintenance of the uh, biodiversity ecosystem and also this cultural necessity. I think that my life now as an artist is to show it's to show how important indigenous culture is for the world and how important it is that uh, today's indigenous artists can actually uh, dominate Western art. So talking a little bit about these uh, Western art codes, part of your work has a very intimate relationship with this uh, rereading of these colonial materials 19th century materials of this uh, reappropriation, domination of these materials. You talk a lot about use and expression, which I will develop a little bit when I uh, speak of this notion of uh, the right to answer. I would like you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, as vis-a-vis -vis these materials that are here in the exhibition or about which you did uh, interventions like we saw before, how do you see the, the dealings, so to speak, with these materials? I understand that the artist and the work of art in the Western world uh, walk hand to hand with the official history of these territories in Brazil. We have artists that without their works, the Brazilian people wouldn't know about their own history. We have uh, Pedro Américo, for instance, an artist that created a lot of works that are in every school book where kids in Brazil learn about the construction of 
that territory, but at the same time, we have artists, non-Brazilian artists, such as Debris, Rugendas, artists that were traveling artists or not, who captured the beginning of the colonization of Brazil, who also are in the school books. So the work of art and the artists are, are so, as important as uh, the historians for an understanding of the territory and its history. But what happens is that some of these artists never came to Brazil, some of them. They did all their work based on, uh, on tales by or reports by sailors or other people who were here. And these works of these artists are in all the school books and kids learn that and they become adults believing in that discourse as shown in those works of art. When an indigenous person has access to this history of Brazil, illustrated by the work of art, doesn't recognize the artist doesn't recognize themselves as part of that as participant on the history of brazil or the americas or part, participating in the construction of this country what i do is to think that we in brazil have 522 years of existence and all of us learned one single perspective of history, and that is perspective is uh, based in the works of art significantly, or the perspective of artists. So I think that we indigenous artists have that right to uh, answer or reply these this history or this Brazilian historical fiction and that's where my research and my work comes in to transform while at the same time re transforming official historical documents and uh, images official images of colonization and also or redo or remake other documents or create new documents with a new fiction based on an indigenous perspective. The issue of uh, using these uh, images and documents by these traveling artists, for instance, is these are images that are recognizable, easily recognizable by any Brazilian and by many people. So. So uh, then they perceive the critical tone of some things. So I imagine that when you get an image that is has wild, wide recognition, and uh, it's like a part of uh, the common knowledge of society, and then you insert a uh, element that destroys what's already known or provoking a new look, it's a way to try to bring attention to some very important colonization themes. When I uh, pick up a, 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 an image by Theodore Debris and I transform it or the people in the image or I insert uh, sentences or text with a little bit of sarcasm uh, making fun of that image a little bit, what I want to say is this image is a fiction by an European artist. How about we think, what's the point of view that a person that was original of the territory would have? An official document is important because it, it, this erases a history of colonization. And when you uh, change that, you can say a lot. And at the same time, is a transgression, disobeying the state order 
so that we can think of on a, a different uh, a neutral uh, history of those territories. That's a little bit that you do in this work here, this thing of uh, striking out much of the work that what ideas do you have that this work has is different from the public in the Brazilian context and also in the context of where you have you have uh, taken some action more frequently. What is the opportunity? What opportunity that America's bring to you? Well, let's think about, when I think about a work and elaborate a work in general, I don't want to communicate with people who are different than I am. When when I was invited, she said a very interesting comment. She made an interesting comment about Los Angeles, the presence of uh, Latin and Americans, and also of the, the presence of Mexicans in Los Angeles was seen as something that really marked and the work of art that maintains that places it has to do with the lives of those people. And I have been to several places. I have talked to other people that look like me in the world, have a similar life. People who are have, have an indigenous origin from many places. And it seems like the story repeats itself in many places. The story of the people. There's a, they talk a lot the Aboriginal people of people from Central America, from North America. So my beginning of thinking about those works is not only to talk about other people, but the people that look like me. And I give a lot of importance due to the exposition. There were people that have come approached me to talk to me, and and were, they were very emotional about it. There were people from South America and from Mexico, or or uh, descendants of people that were from. North America, they said to me words like, what are you saying is very important. What you are saying makes sense for us to be part of that territory. What you're saying had to be said by someone. And at the same time, it made me happy that people recognize them, but then I it makes me sad as to why it was not done before in that place. So the first part of my process, and I want to provoke in terms of ideas, in those people that uh, that look like me socially, historically, economically, culturally, at Getty, that Getty recognizes space of people that struggles that work for that kind of work. And, and at the second glance, I would like to talk to people that don't look like me, not economically, not culturally, not academically, which are people who are at higher levels, higher than where I am. And then, the ideas that I want to feed and nurture in these people is a provocation to us to, is that what we have always learned? Is it 
the way that I look at things is a way that that embraces all po other points of view or not. It's like if someone who never heard about of the of the original topic or a person who never worried about colonization to read a document that he always saw it and had my intervention there and be provoked and ask himself, did I read this document properly, adequately? Do, did I take into account the history of that territory or is there a fiction or even what other interests are there behind that document and engravements? And we can think in Brazil, even for indigenous people in Brazil to think, to be criticized as a person who registered, engraved much of the slavery of the African people here. And many are criticized without understanding uh, the importance of that for the struggle against slavery in Brazil. So when I make an intervention, I also want to say, I want to provoke new thoughts, new thinking, new points of view, new ideas about how to read those documents. Because in fact, I think, I believe, even I, for a long time in, in school, I learned about cannibalism, how they were furious and cannibals, and that the church uh, would free you, set you free from uh, hell or from a life, a degradating life. I, even myself, I thought that. And for a long time, I believed that my culture was a wrong culture. So when I learned to read those documents in a different way, I began to understand that there's a lot behind those documents and those engravers. There is a lot of history about their struggles, their struggle for their own interests, even of the kings and their kingdoms that were created in Americas. So if I could, with my work, provoke a reflection about, about there is an influence, my influence in the civilization, to me, I have gained a lot already very well the news i think we're going to open uh, to uh, questions from the public and i will mediate that translation here of the questions that we have here We have a question from Zoom. Hello, excuse me. Three question, nine question. Um, thank you, Jimmy Susan. I wanted to ask you about the anatomical imagery that is in your interventions in the exhibition, especially when we think about 16th century European culture of dissect, human dissection and anatomical discovery and cannibalism. Um, I, I just noticed that throughout some of your works that we see here at the GRI, and I'd love to hear you talk more about it. Thank you. You talk really fast. Tisby, you may know her. She's asking a question as to, to talk a little bit more about the anatomic image that you overlap or you put on top of the intervention, which is one of the dissemination images used 
And many of those images, we have them in our Getty's library. And she wants you to talk a little bit more as to how you deal with those overposition of the interior of the body, of the anatomy. Okay. There's something there's something that that, that humanity shares some endings a common endings is that we share alike and also different with organs and things that have to do with our body but our bodies are still the same and something else that took me to think about that work is that there was a, a war had begun between protestants and catholics and we were like right in the middle of that fight like a representation of cannibalism and a meridian and a catholic cannibalism when you eat the body of christ as one of the catholic rites and that was a little bit funny as to how the, that european religious dispute puts in the middle a very specific situation of a, an american culture in American indigenous, and one of the representations that to put in between the religious fight between Protestants and Catholics is to put the Indians as as demon, demons, as barbarians, demons, ready to eat other human beings without any kind of respect towards God and to the church. And that engravings, just as many others, but we're talking about this one, has those indigenous people with their very pointed teeth, their teeth as paws and uh, the feed as paws of animals. And then I began to think, how, how is that relationship of contact and violence in the story of Brazil, in the history of Brazil, of course, we had many confrontations among uh, indigenous groups and the colonizers, the settlers. But according to the official documents, that exchange was friendly. Like when the Indians mistreated the Portuguese people in Brazil, this is history also tells us that when they arrived in Brazil, They were uh, came from far away and tired and hungry. And these people that received them also fed them and then they were betrayed by them later. And in their manifestations, there is always the European as a savior carrying Christ cross and ready to be converted to Christianism and to be spared from criminal actions. And uh, you ignore great part of this history and focus only on the element that is unprofitable, which is translated as cannibalism. So at work, when I'm working, I try to uh, put down the idea of what we are as a body, as a human body, and what we have in common, and what are our differences. 
that we have with the enemy, knowing that we are the same as human beings, which makes us to become enemies and go into war, which is very, a lot of abstracts derived from the understanding of different cultures, of the lack of understanding of other cultures. And I always joke about, like, putting some sandals on and some gloves of a, that belong to a dinosaur to say that maybe when the Europeans are right in America, or the people that had paws that were black, maybe he was just because they were invited to parties when they came here because they did not understand they were seen as violent acts. As an attempt to make an irony of regarding what happens when you are not willing to understand the other. Thank you, Danielson. We have one more question here. Thank you for a we have another question here. Um, I'm very conscious also of the tragedy of the loss of the Amazon and people dying, and it was in everybody's tragedy. And I really want to know if indigenous thinking can save the world, because European thinking is not doing a very good job. Could, could you please repeat the question? Um, I want to know if indigenous thinking can save the world. Great question. First, I'd like to say that uh, it's a lot of responsibility to leave that in the indigenous shoulders, saving the world after so, all this time. I don't know if the uh, indigenous peoples have all this power to change the, the minds and the energy of the whole world. after all this decadence. However, I think that the indigenous peoples, as people who were never heard, now that they, they're able to have a voice and be heard, they bring important elements that in a certain moment in history, in, the West, in Western history, understood the understanding of communities, understanding that we are in, in a f finite planet, that there are no borders, that we cannot build a new world. There is a need to rethink our current lifestyle so that we have a, a livable planet. These are things that Europeans and the West 
uh, we also see people who think like this. We're talking about that talk about taking care of the planet and our existence. But it seems like there is another Western people who think they'll see the planet as a, a, a infinite source of raw materials or to extract goods. The indigenous peoples have a very diverse thought of how this planet is and how we should inhabit it. Maybe now being heard, we need to use new words, a new Western vocabulary that was never part of our discussions. I don't know if this will save the planet or will save us from our decadence, but maybe it'll make us think about new ways of life. We have, we have any more questions? We have a question in Portuguese here. Let me read it. Oops. Chelsea asks you, are museums still spaces for not open to the masses and still an elite space? Do you see the insertion of your work in schools exactly to provoke this rupture with the way we educate uh, uh, the kids, how would this space look to facilitate these, this rupture? Yes, of course. I love to be in museums. I love to be in uh, galleries, in uh, shows in Brazil, in the United States, France, all throughout Europe. I like my work circulating within institutional environments, but of course, that as a part of a Amazonic movement built around a, a collective, important for me is the public status of the art. It doesn't make sense for me that my work is uh, encased within walls or inside buildings or whatever the access to the public is closed whether for a ticket price or a reservation or or a reserve sorry actually or that is hard for the general public to access fernanda pita knew that when i did a a, a work at pinacoteca that brings my presence outside the gallery outside the museum it's an experience that i like to make my my work public and yes, my life as an artist is based in trying to create a means to work for so my uh, works as well as other artists to be on his school history books because art only makes sense to me as a way to uh, for public construction and communication. For me, art has to be public. It can't be statized. In spite of the fact that I like to be inside museums, for me, it's a much bigger joy when I see a work of art mine in the streets, in public space, in discussions, in universities, in debates in schools, especially in Brazil. There's a specific law about uh, the insertion of a uh, black culture in public schools for me art makes sense when it helps build uh, a different thought and uh, helps with awareness of society as a whole Uh, 
we had um, a question that we didn't. Okay. Um, then you so para a gente encerrar um pouco. Aqui. In closing a bit, a little, we'd like to hear you talk a little more about this moment uh, of uh, indigenous art within the Brazilian context, but also this concept, context that where you're uh, inserted, like here in the United States. How do you perceive these relationships if you've been looking for or searching for collaborations. If you're interested in these exchanges of uh, experience, uh, trans-American experience and uh, uh, inter exchanges. Yes, of course. Important to think in Brazil that I've been very impressed with the increase in the uh, world of art and the production of artworks in Brazil where we have supports, concepts, styles, different ways of thinking. This has been, this has made me very happy too. And I'm a little concerned now that I am part of a second generation of artists that is already in the past. There's a newer generation of artists that go a lot beyond me and my generation. I am considering he artists of first generation, artists of, of, from the 19th century and early 20th century that go up to the 90s or the odds in Brazil. And I'm from the second generation already. And now we see the third generation, fourth generation that is growing. This impresses me a lot. Consider when you consider that in Brazil, a little over four years ago, that's when this became this all became public. The work of these artists started to appear in uh, Brazilian exhibitions, even in the 70s or 60s. Works by Amazon artists were in Denmark, in Berlin, but never acknowledged in Brazil. But talking about my experience here, since I, the time when I decided to dedicate myself to art, the process, uh, our art thinking, I have had as reference other movements outside Brazil. For instance, art movements in North America, in Canada, Australia, always aiming to observe who came before me, what processes they used, and what I can learn from those processes. And when I'm able to go to these places, in 2018-19, I went to Canada, and I met artists, Anishinaabe, Blackwoods, and others. It was very interesting for me. When I went to Los LA now, one of the first things that I did was to try to find out who were the original peoples of those places. And when I found out who these people were, there were people in these peoples, the artists, and then I go back to LA very soon to realize some work with an indigenous uh, artist from LA. So for me, there was a political and social uh, articulation to join artistic processes by indigenous artists wherever I go, especially when you consider that my work doesn't make sense by itself. It makes sense when there is a collective, a partnership. So that's my process. And in Brazil, I think that soon we'll have a lot of surprises because what I see in production is very impressive. Thank you for participating. And um, yeah, so. Denilson, obrigada. Denilson, thank you. If you 
want to say a last goodbye to everybody who's watching you, as well as uh, via Zoom broadcast. You can leave your message for the people. I would like to thank everybody who is here listening and also for the invitation and the partnership in the work, everything that I've learned throughout this time. And I'd like to say that I have a lot of respect for your work and your uh, your history, your posture. I admire you a lot and I am very grateful that we're uh, working together in this project. I'd like to thank you for this bridge and certainly to be in on Getty today has a lot of our partnership in other projects where I could think about the history of the arts. So it's a pleasure to be talking to you here. That we had the opportunity to talk about this and other process about the presence of the indigenous in the arts in Brazil. Thank everybody from Getty for uh, the warm welcome. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you again. I hope to see you again soon in person. Okay, so now we have a 15 minute break for some coffee. So you come back with a lot of ideas and questions for our next presenters. <laughs> Congratulations, you made it to the last part. You're still alive. <laughs> um, let me introduce you to Renato Meneses. He's curator at Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo. Uh, Meneses is a PhD candidate at the Col de Cotes Institute and Science Sociales in Paris. Really bad French. <laughs> His interests include the representation of affections in the visual arts since the early modern period, as well as the cultural exchanges between Europe and Latin America. He has recently co edited Franza Artatica, Ensayos Interdisciplinares from 2021. Welcome, Renato. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here and I would like to thank you Dury, for the invitation and um, uh, thank you again for the pleasure that was working together during the process that resulted in this, exhi in this exhibition. So I will pass to my paper in order to control my time, my paper in Portuguese. So, the debate around the terminology that is most adequate to define the arrival of the conquerors is still open to the Americas. In the past, we used to talk about discovering these terms, the fifth centenary of the, of the Americans, of the Americas, 1902 was celebrated. Then in the in the year 2000, it was the turn for Brazil to celebrate its fifth centenary, ignoring the work views that, of the, that was today, we prefer to talk about invasion because we had a collective awareness that the story of the Americas cannot be hostage to to Europeans narratives that go around the European interests. That term paradigm that is stimulated on one, one side by what the specials describe as a colonial, the colonial term and also the repair, historical repair throughout 400 years of expansion of the European colonies in the in the world. What does that change in terminology means? Or better yet, what does that change can say? The word discovery comes from the, the Latin term discovery, which is 
the prefix this, which is the contrary action or position and the radical that means burials over position, coperire, that in turn is formed by the particle from which is has an intense indicated that is derived from arterio, which is a word that is cognate to operio, which designates, give a ceiling to cover this coperire, which is the exhumation, the extraction from the soil, and by extension to expose, bring to light, to present, or a limit to repair the vision to unveil unveil and take move the curtain away from and in the 16th century the term of uh, the meaning of discovery it was to uh, brought to the human minds the notion of places that had no knowledge of by the rediscovery of antiquities that's not a mere coincidence of excavations. The idea of this discovery supports the colonization, the rhetoric. But one of the main images that even to the Americans for the European day, they went after the theater and anchored on the theater proposed by El Nino. It was possible to store in the memory many informations starting from a mental schema for the knowledge and experience, for practical knowledge and experience. The front line of the theater of the Terrarum of Adam Ortelius, the front line of America de Especio by the Stradanos, or the front line of of the natural history of William Pisa, the front lines of Theodore de Blin, where I, where I uh, point out America's Isapaz and to a great extent of the, of the first part of Nova Reperta, they go after the theater, not only because they can present their works, but he has a vision of world. They constitute a, a privileged vehicle of disseminating the idea of discovery, always revealing the presentation and the, the show, not only of America, but, but also delayed in the scale of the global of the globe that they want to transmit. On the other hand, the word invasion is also a Latin origin, Iubadere combines the prefix in, which denotes the existence of the inner part as opposed to the outer part, and also an advancement towards the inside, the entry with the particle vatere that derives from the infinitive vado, which is inher inherits the European verhins, which Vienus, the sacred, and in Latin, or the words like ire, that denotes movement and velocity. Root raise is usually related to verbs that uh, related to impulse, impetus. What philo philologists from Argentina denominated as Manojar of the Passions. It was, she was very present in the in the ancient history, ensuring the power of gods over people, invaded the notes, therefore, to go in with impetus, with violence and force in a territory in order to appropriate it, finish with it, steal, steal it, and make it a possession of the conquerors. So also denoting the uh, the knowledge of expansion that became closely associated to the appropriation and the 
irregular use of certain territories. That Maybe that is why Sisimic has been avoided by European diligence, particularly Spaniards that always avoided the words conquer and substituting it with settlers and people where they, they were also spreading the black culture. It, however, without altering the object, therefore is an euphemism. It has to do with euphemism when we know in the engravings, which is something that is mostly uh, publicized by Notre Dame, the entry of Americo Vespucci in those lands. There was no effort was spared by Nostradamus to reinforce the idea of discovery in all the elements of the image. It's not by any chance that the figure of America is nude with its body revealed, uncovered before the traveler that goes in the land. The rhetoric of colonization is fails when we understand that the, tra the entry of the travelers in those lands symbolically represents violation of its own body. Everything in the image betrays euphemism in Stradamus and the idea of invasion it goes over the discovery. As Chris and Keening observed, the allegory of the continent offers us a narrative and experience of the meeting of erotic or sexual encounter. And they also take you back to the discover also of these direct consequences. Crossing the Atlantic and the appropriation of lands are the, the basis where culture is developed and the fertility belong to the central forces who simply cannibal applications belong to different moments in this in the colonial speech. The idea of fertility crosses the description of America and in a certain way reflect part of was the experience. In general, the fertility with the allied with the exuberance, opulence, seduction justify the desire to advance as an energy for creation, but as a power, action of power only. If we go, we request in terms of etymology, in terms of colonization from the verb colo, that means in Rome, I live, I occupy the land, and by extension, I cultivate the soil. It divides its root with the word culture, which is, has to do with the people that inhabited the land, also the agriculture. As very well observed, I have your policy is not by chance that you, every time you want to classify the colonizations, you distinguish two processes. The one that has to do with just the settling and that one that explores the soil. The letter written by Americo Vestuso to Imedici, published about 1504, the notion of the continent is Co-founded all the time. He writes, and I'm going to cite America Vespucci, another custom of those indigenous people. The truth is that they're women, as they are living in us. They, they just go out of form. They because of some uh, poisonous animals. And because of that, many of them lose their barilis and become ernocos. There are no fabric or wood made of satin because they don't need it. 
they live at the same time without a king or without a command and you own yourself you're responsible for yourself so they take as many dreamers as they want as many times as they want they break marriages without any kind of order the the principle of that principle according to Vespucci is rooted in the in the practices of a meridian that goes from politics to sexual Ahead, Vespucci goes into the fertility of the soil and says, the soil of those regions is very fertile and many valleys and mountains, rivers that have great forces that very much dense with a many animals, many of which give a great flavor to their food, and others do not bear anything. And none of the fruit are the same as ours. They are produced uh, herbals and roots that they make very tasty food and bread. There is no metal products, only gold, but we didn't see it, we didn't see it in this navigation. If you want to remember everything that is there and write about the variable animals, the thing would be prolix and very extensive. I certainly believe that our old Plinio did not touch in one tenth of the gender of the papadayo or parrots or that artists would fail in painting them. The theme of the infinite forest, which density limits, limits the faculty of the observer, also shows up in Pedro Alcabrile, Pedro Alcabrile, Pedro Alcabrile, Pedro Alcabrile and is manifested this time as a the thread, he writes, this soil got from one point that, that we went up, up to the northern part, most northern part, there will be 20 to 25 leguas of the, from the coast. They are very, there are barriers, some are red, other are white, and uh, and the land is full of trees. From one point to the other, there are a lot of seeds, very, very charming. Looking at the inside, it looks very nice looking at it from the sea. You could only see land with trees. Another topic that comes out as an obstacle to penetrate the territory is the soil and body is cannibalism which is in the last plan, in the last plan of the engraving for Nostradamus. It's very well known, the narrative of Michael Jr. about the desire that he, of a woman that he describes as a cannibal. De acordo com seus costumes, tive desejo de me deleitar com ela. Quando quis realizar meus desejos, ela se debateu ferozmente e me arranhou de tal maneira com suas unhas que teria sido preferível nunca ter me envolvido com ela. Mas tomei uma corda só para contar para vocês e amarrei-a. Nisso, ela soltou um grito tão inaudito. Then she yelled so loudly uh, that was hard to believe. When she stopped, I rescued my desire for her, and I can affirm that from that point on, she behaved in such a way as if she had been trained in a school of horrors, end of quote. In spite of all the obstacles, penetration of the American territory was drastically done 
and maybe we'll find in the Cerro Rico's images in Potosí its most dramatic expression. An image that was printed by Theodore Debris shows a longitudinal cut of the uh, entrails of the mountain accessed to the orifice crossed by uh, a crowd, uh, a lot of uh, workers explored, explore, exploit the exploring silver. This is the most absolute example of the Alfredo Bose's hypothesis, according to which a colonizing act work on the land is always tends to uh, exert domination over the land. These images then ex explain the creation of uh, colonizers, euphemisms having to do with the extraction and exploitation of natural resources in American territory, as well as the violation of the Amerindian bodies. The meeting between Europeans and Amerindians, which was uh, romanti romanticized by the Stradamus, could be defined in the terms of the uh, French uh, French historian Jobsis with the shock of the conquest. He understands as shock of the conquest the violent confrontation between two different visions, sometimes antagonic, antagonic that has as a product the mix, uh, racial mixing. The, so the mixed race would be a product of colonial exploitation marked by a crescent uh, elimination of the indigenous element and then the black element to which the white element should uh, be superimposed. In the 18th and 19th century, when uh, mixed race uh, people became a, uh, a uh, policy of uh, widening of the populations of the Americas, the indigenous mixed race became uh, the autochthonous in detriment of all the other populations. The most emblematic example of that can be found in the Irasema novel. That's the English translation of the more Yera Sema de Novo, which was published in 1865 by the Brazilian writer José de Alencar. Yera Sema, daughter of a Tupi warrior, Vestal, who uh, uh, has in her body the secret of Ajurema, is daughter of uh, Araquen, a Tabajara shaman. She falls in love with Martin, a Portuguese traveler, associated to the Potiguaris, which are Tabajara enemies. The broad iconography produced by Brazilian artists representing Iracema always reinforces the, her sadness provoked by the impossible desire of having Martin as her uh, companion. From this pro forbidden uh, romance, Moacir, is born, the first miscegen, uh, miscegenated Brazilian. Iracema? It's an anagram of America, and that's not a coincidence. Another example is the Guaibin, Guaibin Pará, who, differently from Iracema, a fictional character, there are several records of uh, the, her, his existence. Source uh, from Aguayatum Pará would have met a uh, Diogo Alvarez, Caramuru, uh, with whom she uh, uh, left for France, where she was baptized, receiving then the name of Catarina Paraguasu. The history of this couple is in a uh, epic uh, poem from the uh, Portuguese uh, friar called where the image of Catarina Paragosu appears to our eyes uh, that shows the, the whole colonization process. Manuel Lopes Rodriguez, an artist from Bahia, you can see Catarina Paragosu almost fully acculturated, contrasting with her vision of uh, Our Lady, uh, 
you can see a discreet uh, feather that is still in her face. Now, Holmo's painting, paint, uh, painting representing the same episode, eliminates all her, the traces of her indigenous uh, identity and uh, whitens her skin, breaking any uh, any connections she would have to her culture, continuing the process of a violation and uh, colon and a culture. The bet in the euphemism is uh, doubled down until it becomes cynical. Now. We're here in the 19th century. The myth of the penetration of the American body is uh, interspersed with the narrative of a romantic love. Whoever thinks that mixed race only left in the American uh, populations the mark of uh, violence is wrong. There's a deep feeling of a submission that was uh, born out of the exploitation uh, process that needs rescue. The f image of uh, Catarina Paraguasu appears in a public monument of great importance in Bahia, dedicated to the so-called independence of Bahia, a popular movement that gar guaranteed the separation between Brazil and Portugal in 1823 at the top of the monument you can see a caboclo or a uh, mixture between white and uh, an indian who are uh, is stabbing the dragon of tyranny the word caboclo is the interaction between indigenous non-indigenous white and black where the Im element indigenous element somehow prevails in the brazilian popular culture num there are numerous examples of manifestations where caboclos are protagonists in the northeast of Brazil. Maracatu, uh, music rhythm that is at the same time religious and, uh, and a celebration has as the protagonist a uh, caboclo with a spear. The little caboclos or caboclinos, it's a dance executed during carnival the biggest uh, holiday in the Brazilian calendar. Candomblé de Caboclo also arises in northeastern Brazil with the interaction between Oxóssi, the African god of uh, plenty and uh, hunt, and the Amerindian cultures. The monument to the independence of Bahia, which was inaugurated in 1856, celebrates with the vocabulary inherited from the old world what is occurring since late 19th century is actually actualized in the uh, bahia population every july caboclos uh, have a manifestation in uh, in the city and they go they walk throughout the city with uh, the statue of catherine paragosu they uh, commemorate freedom as a popular conquest uh, reminding everybody of independence and uh, manifesting to whoever wants to see their insubmission. Throughout the streets, they uh, sing an anthem that is composed of the, uh, of the of these verses. Nevermore, nevermore, despotism will generate our actions because tyrants do not go well with Brazilians and Brazilians' hearts. Caboclos constitute or comprise a chapter that you can't escape in the independence of the Americas and especially the independence of Brazil. If the colonization narratives are crossed by the force of invasion, violence and conquest, we must retake the narratives that come out of the caboclo body crossed by the arrows of time and transforms, wins and celebrates. As Crystallized by Abdias Nascimento, this arrow of time crosses the territory, reaches the dragon of tyranny, and reconnects us to the experience of insubmission with the flag of freedom in hands. Thank you very much.
Now we're gonna hear from Fernanda Pita, who is professor at the Museum of Contemporary Art at the University of Sao Paulo. Her research interests focus primarily on discussing paradigms of national art, international and post-colonial contexts. She is co-editor of Trabajo de Artistas, Imagine to Imagine from 2018, and Ana Maria Tavares in The Very Place from 2016. Well, thank you everyone for being here and holding up uh, to uh, my talk. And um, I'd like to thank uh, very much the GRI, uh, Idu Alonso, for her generosity and dialogue, Tisby uh, Gessner for her kindness and patience, and my colleagues, Nicholas, Tom, Renato, and Daniele, and especially, Nilson Baniwa for his trust, his care, and his friendship. I'll read and try to keep it not too painful for you. <laughs> During uh, the 2020 carnival in Brazil, the hashtag Indigena Não é Fantasia was one of the most widespread on social media. The hashtag launched in 2018 by rapper Katumirin, a self-declared indigenous person, condemned the appropriation of the image of indigenous person by non-indigenous people. In 2020, it was once again activated in the fact, in the face of the fact, no, yeah, sorry, in the face of the fact that a well-known Brazilian actress, Alessandra Negrini, Queen of the Academicus of Baixo Augusta Bloc, appeared in that year's parade wearing a headdress and her body covered with indigenous graphisms. Negrini's costume was intended to show support for the indigenous cause, a position contrary to the maneuvers of the Bolsonaro government, which tried to regularize the expropriation of indigenous lands and mining on the, med the market lands in addition to placing names that were evidently anti-indigenous in critical positions, such as the presidents of the FUNAI. Accompanied by leaders, two of them today elected federal deputies in Brazil, Sonia Guajajara and Celia Chacriabá, the costumed actors generated a new opportunity for discussion of the appropriation of the image of indigenous people by popular carnival custom, the Indian custom, and even more broadly, the limits and contradictions of the attitudes that white people have towards the representation of indigenous peoples. Although the articulation of indigenous peoples, the APIP, the most important uh, indigenous organization in Brazil now, sided with the artist and endorsed that Indian custom, the position was not widely accepted by other indigenous leaders. Pagu Rodriguez made this discounted explicit, drawing attention to a positional difference that whiteness tends to ignore when it wants to present itself as an ally to indigenous causes. And I quote, there are several ways to support our struggle and appropriation is not one of them. When we wear our feathers and our paintings, what we suffer is called racism. Representation, appropriation, right of reply. These are the themes that I would like to discuss with you today, starting from the opportunity that the exhibition Reinventing the Americas, Construct, Erase, Repeat, presents to us, presents us with. I would like to approach it in two parts. First, I will briefly discuss some of the images regimes of the representation of indigenous peoples present in the works of the exhibition, especially those from the beginning of the 19th century. Then, I will propose a reflection about, about the operation carried out by the artist Denilson Baniwa on a set of prints representing indigenous bodies and manners, some of them present in the exhibition 
also. This operation, which the artist calls erasure or hazura, is enunciated in the sequence in the sequence of the three verbs in the show's subtitle: construct, erase, repeat. I am interested in discussing particularly how the art artist's, artist's operation of erasure, hazura, in the reiterated procedure of construction, erase it erasure and repetition makes evident the projections and contradictions of these e image regimes which regard to the representation of indigenous people. In parallax, his operation sheds light on the crisis of these regimes of representation in the 19th century, represented by the parodic alternative, a crisis that remains as a trauma today. A trauma that Baniwa's production elaborates through a right of reply. Roughly speaking, the images of indigenous peoples produced until the middle of the 19th century, flying images that appear in illustrations of travel reports, such as those by Hans Staden, Jean de Lerie, or Theodore de Brie, and migrate to countless other supports, share a regime that we could call allegorical. They're representation crosses the allegories of America and is transmuted, including gender from feminine to masculine, in the allegories of the Brazilian kingdom, the genius of Brazil, the Brazilian empire, or its parts, such as rivers, which take the figure of the indigenous person as the embodiment of the limits of the territory and its qualities. And here you can see three of those images that um, show this figuration, uh, this allegorical figuration of the indigenous body as allegory of the territory and of the uh, empire itself. Fractures of meaning, expressions of convention, if we accept Walter Benjamin's definition, such allegories, first of all, mark, make explicit the materials previously sedimented in them before be, being allegorical representations of indigenous peoples, they are projections of European fantasies about the inhabitants of the new world, guided by their visual codes and their regimes of representation. The simple example of the detail of the engraving of an identified authorship of the anthropophagic ritual that accompanies the account of the adventurer and mercenary Hans Staden, true story and description of land of savages, et cetera, et cetera, of 1557, evidently suffices to make this point. In the first decades of the 19th century, however, another regime of image imposes itself to the representation of indigenous peoples. Created by European scientists, travelers, and diplomats, they configure a naturalist look built as well as allegorical images, in necessar it's necessary to remember, in a close relationship with the texts to which they serve as illustration and participating in the truth regime of science, politics, and their institutions. Constructed as scientific objects, representations of indigenous bodies, manners, and cultural modes share in the nat naturalist project of scrutinizing the world and objectifying it as a resource or threat. Observing them, above all, is an exercise in understanding the criteria for ordering and valuing the world that operate in the visual framework of these authors. For example, when looking at engravings based on Johann Moritz Hugenda's drawings published in his book, Viagem Pitoresca Através do, do Brasil, of uh, uh, 1835, we learn about the importance that Bavarian painter gives to the family as a social arrangement, as well as, as, well as to the social habits of burying the dead, the technologies of transportation, hunting and fishing, and how he reflects on the effect on Europeans of the contact with indigenous populations. 
We notice in the, profile, in the profiles of indigenous peoples published by the text of Count of, the, of, Count of Castelnau, a naturalist who had been sent to South America by King Louis Philippe of France between 1843 and 1847, the taxonomic impulse to classify human beings into types, to observe their physiognomic characters with the purpose of projecting evo evolutionary criteria and subsiding evaluations regarding the greater or lesser danger they represent. We can reflect on the hierarchies through which he organizes human beings and assigns them degrees of evolution. From naked to clothed, the observance of ceremonies, protocols, and the usefulness of their knowledge. All those engravings are accompanied by texts and also uh, labels that describe uh, what um, um, the, the, um, the narrative points out as useful, manasful, or uh, curious in the view of uh, the explorer. <clears throat> This regime of the naturalistic image imposes itself through the 19th century as a form of representation of indigenous peoples, even combining itself with allegorical regimes. I return, oops, sorry. I return to the example of the equestrian statue of Dom Pedro I by Louis Rocher, made in 1862, it features Indians, indigenous peoples whose bodies, uh, who embody the rivers that define the borders of the empire. But these allegories are meticulously constructed not from precepts of classical statuary, but from direct anthropological study of living indigenous bodies. Here you can see some of the uh, casts that uh, Rocher made in Brazil and they are now in, the, uh, in France in the natural, uh, Musée d'Histoire uh, Naturelle uh, in Paris. They all uh, represent different uh, peoples from Brazil, uh, women, men, children, uh, and uh, they were used as, you know, uh, part of uh, the building process of the monument. It is tempting to think that the clash between these two regimes of representation, one allegorical, the other naturalistic, has caused the emergence of a third way of representing the indigenous uh, person for a generation of Brazilian artists trained at the Academy uh, of Fine Arts. But in contrast, with the naturalistic representation of travelers, a regime that we could call, borrowing the expression of Italian historian living in Brazil, Luciano Migliaccio, parodic. Works such as Derrubador Brasileiro by Almeida Júnior, Faceira by Rodolfo Bernadelli, Marabá and O Último Tamoio uh, by uh, Rodolfo Amoedo, parody both the tradition of the historicized nude, allegorical representations, but also naturalist representations. Such images deliberately position themselves ambiguously about what the naturalist regime constructed as the indigenous type, its regime of truth. The investigation about their abilities, their usefulness for the civilizing project of the new nation are put in check in the shuffle uh, they produce. For it, the naturalist regime aimed to identify and deter determine the role that indigenous populations could play, offering their knowledge and technologies, their cultures and beliefs, the to the extractivist character of these investigations went hand in hand with a reality of subjugation, erasure, physical and epistemic violence. The parodic images of indigenous peoples in the 1880s bec become therefore 
a sign of a recalcitrance, both of the representation of violence with which they were treated by Brazilian society and of the anguished expectation of the elites for a new social, political, and economic arrangement for the nation in which they needed the indigenous populations. Remember that the, uh, we are at that point at the end of the slavery system in Brazil but could not conceive on their autonomous and self-determined presence. An episode can still help us circumscribe the complexity of this imagetic crisis. In 1882, the anthropological exposition of the National Museum was held in Rio de Janeiro, an unprecedented undertaking in Brazilian science until then, whose goal was to make as in a quote Anderman on this, celebration, a celebration of anthropology as the achievement of an impartial and objective perspective of an internal order that had so far provided the monarchic state with, an, with one of its main artistic and literary icons. It was still, according to this author, the opportunity to assess, given the material evidence, evidence of indigenous life, of their concrete existence, and I quote, the usefulness of the indigenous person as a representative of the modern nation. In this exhibition, indigenous peoples were represented by artifacts, skeletons, but also photos, paintings, and life scale models, as you can see here uh, in the photograph on your right side, uh, but also in the casts that were uh, still at the National Museum before it went on fire on 2018. <clears throat> the image of the indigenous person was both an evocation of a remote past, of a primitive, a link in the evolutionary chain, but also a real and uncomfortable presence in the national reality. The clash between these two constructed positions, that of a fossil of the past and of a real and uncomfortable presence, exploded in, Angel in Angelo Agostini's carica caricatures, which comment on the inversion operated, as you can see it in, those, uh, in these uh, images. The group of indigenous peoples, probably from the Kayapo people, uh, who were the bodokas, as you can see in the uh, caricatures, were taken from uh, Espiritu Santo to be present in the exhibition. Um, they were represented as anthropophagian by the caricaturist Pencil, and uh, in those um, characters, you can see them uh, um, chased by a public eager to make contact with these uh, supposed cannibals, forcing them to seek protection in a palace, in the palace of the emperor himself, metamorphosed into an indigenous person uh, after this contact. So, the, is this working? Yeah, you can see them, uh, you know, chased by uh, the public and uh, going uh, uh, meet uh, Pedro II and transforming him into an indigenous leader. The indigenous prints by Hugendas and Castelnau that we saw here and, I, and that I defined in a deliberately schematic way as participants of a naturalist regime of representation are part of the set that in Brazil we call Brasiliana. They constitute a monument of Brazilian visual culture that today is being investigated by contemporary artists such as Denilson Baniwa. Moacir dos Anjos commented on this investigation, defining this interest as a way to, I quote, excavate in images from past centuries that team uh, of Brazil, uh, that team Brazil, sorry, indexes of the violence that formed and constituted the country. And that transformed, persists until today. 
violence against the indigenous peoples who inhabited the lands invaded by Europeans and against black people forcibly brought from Africa and enslaved in Brazil. The attention of this artist to the Brasiliana, still according to Anjos, is related to the fact that, the, that this imagetic monument unveils, I quote, with greater or lesser clarity, the gradual formation of a divided and radically unequal place of life in terms of the access that white and non-white bodies had to an autonomous and protected existence. In the contemporary perception of these images, they actively promote the dehumanization of the racialized bodies they represent, downplay the violence involved in the formation of the Brazilian nation, as well as the ongoing resistance of these same bodies to their process of domination. More than images themselves, the contemporary reaction to, to them elaborates that normalization of the naturalistic gaze and its reiterated presence in Brazilian visual culture, which is perpetuated as a repressing uh, of colonial trauma. In history textbooks, movies, soap operas, advertisements, stamps, postcards, hotel posters, host, hotel posters like this one that I took a uh, picture in 2000. 22 this year. <clears throat> and as the new song Baniwa uh, also mentioned in his talk. The uncritical re repetition of these images and their naturalization in Brazilian visual culture concerns, therefore, the permanence of colonial structures in the present. The new song Baniwa acts up these images by performing an operation he calls erasure or hazura, because erasure is not uh, completely trans translating the, uh, the operation he uh, evokes. The term evokes Derrida's notion of hatur, that which erases itself while remaining visible, destroys itself while giving itself to be seen. A double game that obliterates certain decisive parts. Re the that refers to the text, but we can say that the same of the images and um, what they let us to read or see uh, as it was, it is obliterated. Unlike an erasure, uh, and for this reason, the English tr translation erasure is insufficient to describe the term, the Hazura maintains the original and creates a film of tension in the image. For this reason, in the Nilsung Baniwa's Hazuras, there is no restitution on the horizon, but the continuous affirmation of the indigenous presence against all erasure as a continuous affirmation of the right of reply. And uh, I'll browse uh, quickly uh, through some of uh, those uh, series. Um, this, the first one uh, over um, this um, print in Hogenda's book. Uh, Idu already showed it. It's called Everything is People. And uh, the, the, the balloon reads uh, here, my son. It's your uncle. His erasures produce, to use another, terms, uh, another of Derrida's terms, a deferral effect, that special kind of difference that ensures that meaning of something is one, sorry, that special kind of difference that ensures that the meaning of something is one is fully there. The act of the historical trauma that is the erasure of subjectivity by the appropriation of the self-image by another. The historical trauma of a regime of images that transforms subjects into objects, exposed to the scrutiny of the gaze that intends to capture, measure, define, and explain. The historical trauma imposed by research, 
award that a Maori scholar, Linda Tuhihai, puts it, awakens the worst feelings among the indigenous peoples, who soon remember anthropologists who, after spending a few days or months among the savages, soon believe they know how to define what these others are, how they think, how they live. The Nilson Banyuas Hazuras are also parody. By rewriting what the naturalist's writing erases, the artist proposes a use of the archive subjected to erasure that is distinct from other recent uses of the archive in contemporary art. Unlike what Hal Foster, for example, detects in which archival artists are drawn to historical information that has been lost or suppressed, in which they wish to make physically present once again, Baniwa works with an omnipresent, sorry, omnipresent archive whose status as true through incessantly question hoovers as simulacrum and points of view in the relationship of non-indigenous society to the indigenous. For the artist, this archive functions just like what we may call, also borrowing from Hal Foster's and uh, Franz Fanon, a primary scene of uh, reality imposition. Such a primary scene is one that deprives a racialized person of ontological resistance in the eyes of white people. As Fanon puts it, in the white world, the person of color find it difficult to elaborate his or her body schema. In his word, for a person of color, the knowledge of the body is a purely negational activity. It is a third person knowledge. In the formation of his or her perception, not only his or her own residues of sensations and perceptions of a tactile, vestibular, kinetic, or visual order operate, but the other who weaves for this person of color thousands of details, anecdotes, and stories. And I quote Fanon, I was at once responsible for my body, my race, and my ancestors. I went through myself with an objective gaze, discovered my blackness, my ethnic traits, and then burst my eardrums with anthropology, mental retardation, fetishisms, racial tears, tears, Negroes, and above all, above all the most, Yabom Banania. The operation of Hazura in Baniwas, in Baniwa is therefore an action of counter memory. The content of his erasures is irony, parody, the refuting of edifying messages by antagonistic or dissolving positions. The refuting, uh, sorry, his procedure is also a parallax. He frames the framer while framing the other in an exercise that is also reverse anthropology. More rarely, one more, yes. More rarely, signs emerge that non-indigenous peoples associate with certain indigenous referentials, graphisms, stylizations of animals, human and non-human figures, and which are supposed to be a specific writing of the artist or of his traditions that he has access to decipher. Purposely, the artist does not translate these signs for non-indigenous peoples. Only those interested in knowing his references know that he is freely sampling pictographs from the Upper Rio Negro and other uh, Amazon areas. His claim is to respond to the uses of those images in the history of the country that what that use was enabled and promoted. For it's not to Debre or Rugendas that Baniwa imputes the violence of Brazilian society, but to people like me, non-indigenous, white, who consume these images as true naturalized portraits of Brazil. We are the ones that take these images as document, therefore 
as an index of our reality that we did nothing to avoid, who naturalize and reiterate the privileges, the inequalities, the dehumanizations, the abuses. His erasures, Hazuras, are, are, are a refusal to reduce himself to those images, knowing that he is made of them, and also a call for other racialized people like him to see themselves differently. And I'll quote, end uh, by quoting a poem by uh, Denilson Baniwa. It's called, Everything is People, and it goes together with that first image I show you. My grandparents say that in the old days, before you, me, or any other homo sapiens dominated the planet, everything was people, forest, Humans and non-humans were people. There were people people, parrot people, tree people, stone people, and people people. We all spoke the same language. We understood each other. Time was also different. There were no clocks or alarm clocks. Work was not an accumulating function, but one of collectivity. But this was from a time that neither my grandparents nor lived, or its from the time before time. Today, we do not know the language of birds and plants, of the rocks, streams, and mountains. We no longer remember. We don't even understand each other with our neighbors and res residents of the same planet. I know well that we can get back to that time. But today, we can learn the lost communication. We can begin to think that there is an environment different from us humans. In these times, while there is no time machine that will throw us back to the times of the ancestral world, we can understand again that we are part of the planet and not dominant on it. On it. Art, indigenous or not, can serve as a metaphorical mechanism of translation. Translation of the voices of the forest, of the stones, of the water, and of all living beings. Indigenous art can be an ally in the understanding of words, for it itself transits between the ancestor and the plasticity of the modern world. Indigenous artists can be art shamans who share knowledge brought from all voices, including those we don't even remember exist anymore. Art is what united us, unites us, sorry. It is the connection between the ancestral world and the world we want from now on. Thank you very much. Okay, so I was thinking that, um, and this was not done on purpose, that in the morning we were talking about repetition and construction, and now in the afternoon we're talking about erasure a lot, which are the three words uh, that go after the title of the exhibition. And so when, when I was thinking on the title of the show, I actually thought, what were these images doing? What was the verb that I could attach to what all these images were doing? And that's where that comes from. And it's quite interesting that that is exactly what this uh, symposium ended up bringing up, if we, if we can think about something that connects all these presentations. But uh, before that, I want to go back to your presentation. I was thinking about the importance of etymology, because you, you talked a lot ab about that, uh, about what certain words mean and where they, come, where they come from and what they mean and the importance of that. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, because today um, we're very conscious about what those words mean. I don't know if we understand what they meant back then, when they were used, and I think you did a wonderful job talking about that. 
Um, but so I, I wanted you to, to talk a little bit more about the importance of etymology in, in, this, in this exhibition, in these works. How do we see it today? What is the importance of that today? Okay, I will try to talk about this because it's a difficult question. I know, it's a difficult question. Yeah, a little bit because uh, words have a life um, itself, you know? So I think I was very concerned by this double dimensions of the reinventions of the America, an invention um, that is in the ideological um, plane and also in the practical dimension, you know? It's why my intention to confront Print, um, prints and, um, and daily and and daily um, cultural manifestations, and the same thing happens with the words. I think. I mean, we can talk about many. We can use many words. This word can have. Um, practical use, but also this word, this word can hide some meanings that we just forgot because we cannot think every, every time about this uh, deep sense of the words, you know. My, my intention was um, underlined, underlined, sorry, this um, double every time double um, dimensions of the words. So um, to answer it effectively in your question, I think um, my purpose was think about um, this um, public manifestations about the change of the word. So if we try to change of the word to describe some event, some, something happens because if words means the same thing, it don't, don't make sense um, manifestate to change the words. And my intention was understand what the words mean and what the words can mean. Um, it's why my um, concern to emphasize the idea of um, intensity and um, force and violence um, that the words, the word um, invasion um, have. <laughs> so, um, and for this is, this is why, this is why my, my intention when I established this differentiation between in, uh, invasion and discovery, because discovery is an euphemism, and this euphemism are implicated with a colonial project that we are until today um, implicated. Um, I don't know if I ask you exactly what do you... No, no, that's fine, that's okay. fine. I wanted, okay. I wanted you to talk about, about that specifically. Um, and also I was thinking about this idea of domination uh, and, and how, you know, when you see the image of uh, that image that we have there, right? Um, that is in a way a very romanticized, of course, a very romantic, you talked about that, how romanticized it is and what it, it hides behind. Um, and then I kept thinking about as you were showing more images and you were talking about uh, Katarina, which is also a very romanticized image. And then thinking about the idea of mestizaje and, the, and, and how that it also hides um, a lot of violence uh, on itself, and what it also means in terms of 
um, and, and this is a, a big discussion that that uh, has happened a lot in Mexico, for example, in terms of when you talk about mestizaje, you also forget about the uh, pure indigenous people, right? So in a way, it's also an erasure of some certain other people. And so I was thinking about that idyllic image that keeps being created, and I, I've seen that in your presentation as well, over and over again, and what it hides. So, yeah, so maybe you can both talk about that a little bit. I think this hiding is present in the exhibition. For example, in these two um, sculptures present in the first part of the exhibition, we can see, aside, put it aside, two allegories of America. One allegory have this skin more black, and the other, it's again another allegory of America, but it's much more whited. So white. Uh, so I think this gesture making together these two statues um, aside means something and stimulate this kind of discussion, this discussion that is related to hiding some tra cultural traces and some if cult um, colonial effort to, to um, erase, <laughs> this very important word to us today, uh, to erase some important elements that or um, that reflect a political ideology very compromised with this um, limpeza, how can I say this? This cleaning, this cleaning of um, cultural elements, starting by the skin. Um. I think uh, Renato's presentation bring the subject of um, also um, this resignification of the mestizo and the mestizaje process as uh, not um, a white uh, project of uh, a whitening, but as an empowerment uh, and also an alliance between indigenous peoples and Afro-diasporic peoples. And uh, so I think the, this whole idea of, of a mixture of um, mestizaje is uh, conflictuous, is disputed, uh, but it's also fascinating the way that its ambiguity is not can, cannot be put in one single uh, meaning. And that's uh, why I think those images that I showed you briefly uh, from the fine arts uh, that appear in the 80s in, uh, in the late 19th century in Brazil, they are so interested and I'm invested in thinking about them uh, for so long uh, because they point to uh, something that could not be totally grasped, grasped by um, a dominant um, perspective, and so they, their porosity, their you know ambigu ambiguity, is something that has um, has a productive power of empowerment and uh, of um, uh, antagonism that I find interesting. Yeah, because when I think about um, our gallery from the 19th century, you know, every time I, I, I take a tour and I go from all the colonial images and then I get to the 19th century, um, we always talk about the scientific approach how you don't see anymore an homogeneous um, way of representation, but it's still very problematic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because pe they're treated like objects of a study, and that's what we've seen in, in those uh, images that you've shown. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
That is why I think then what the Nielsen does is to highlight that by what he adds to all these all these images, right? Um, to highlight what is the problem in what you're seeing, mm -hmm. because otherwise, um, I think we have a tendency to to look at these 19th century works not not really thinking about how problematic they are, because they do look more like something that you were more used to those images, right? And so that's why I think, um, yeah, what the Nielsen does is, is it's that, is to, to point out to what is problematic. Yeah, I think he, he does like a double, um, what I was trying to, to um, elaborate here is like this double, um, this double um, objective in his work that one is to highlight uh, how problematic and constructed and um, uh, from a point of view that is specific, those images were uh, made. Uh, but also, uh, so one is like, uh, one of um, one, one part of the public's you and me, but other part of the public is people like him, as he told us, and uh, and also this double meaning, I guess, is something that fascin fascinates me in his work because um, it's all about, in a way. Um, pointing us to the construction of those images, but also pointing uh, to people who suffer when they see those images, how they can, in a way, exercise uh, their violence. Yeah. And going back to the idea of etymology and the importance of words, that's something that the Nielsen uh, does all the time. Like, mm -hmm. when you begin the exhibition with the map that he titles History of Violations, you know? And then um, you'll see throughout the exhibition how he changes titles um, over and over again. So the importance of words and how things are referred to and titled, it's very important in his work as well. Yeah. And um, I love about what I love about that map uh, is that he uh, he crosses, you know, the title and names it history of violations. But he also erases or risks, like puts a line over every single name that is on the map, and every single uh, you know place that was named by. Uh, the colonizer and the invaders, um, and um, this gesture, uh, which is uh, in a way preventing us to see the names in that map, but also uh, pointing to the fact that those names were not um, named by who were living in those lands and who uh, belong to those places. Yeah, and he adds terra indigena to the name of America, so it completes the, and that takes me to Tom's presentation this morning about maps and about how it's a way of, uh, you know, um, violation as well, and um, yeah. And I think, sorry, I think it's also a very pedagogical uh, approach that he does to images and that uh, he also, he always quotes uh, Feliciano Luna, who he mentioned in his talk, uh, who said, um, when a white person cannot understand, I draw. Mm -hmm. So this power, like this pedagogical, pedagogical power of drawings and like, you know, making it visible through images.
Yeah, I, I was just thinking um, while uh, Fernanda is, uh, sorry, I was just <laughs> um, thinking while Fernanda um, talked that words make exist things, right? So when we numb something, this thing, this thing exists. So that happens also with the cartography, graphy, writing. So when we write a map, this territory exists. So it's like a translation. It's so anyway, I, I don't know why exactly I'm talking about this, but <laughs> I just thinking about and I find that this could be important to to point out. Maybe we want to open for questions from the public, yeah? So yeah. We have one question. of discovery uh, because the word discover and the word invention are very closely related in the history of classical rhetoric. It's what you do when you look for topics and find an argument. You discover the argument and you have preset, uh, preset memory devices like a memory palace with different items in it and then you can attach your argument to the different parts so that you can remember a lot. We have to think back to a time when oral culture was much more important than it is now. But in, in, in thinking about the invasion of an autonomous country by discovering it and making it part of an itinerary for an argument, I think that might be another way that you can interrogate this language of the colonizer and replace it with something that's both more accurate and uh, and engages with the active agency of the indigenous people post post colonization. Um, so that, that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to say was just a comment. I was lucky enough uh, to be in the National Anthropology Museum in Rio just a few years before the whole thing burned down. And I was when I was listening to Dennis Slow's uh, discussion of how a Brazilian indigenous people, but everybody absorbs the colonizer's narrative from debris. In the front room of that museum, there were uh, blow-ups of debris cannibal images uh, from uh, Delery all over the walls, and then uh, objects that were associated with cannibalism in there. And this is the museum. It was so poorly, it's such a rich collection and so poorly displayed and it burned down because the, there were no fire extinguishers. But this is the museum where all the school kids come all the time, year after year. And so listening to him talk about that from his perspective, it's so, it's so, um, it just, I don't know, it's very upsetting to me to see that, but very uh, promising to think about the new uh, forms of articulation of that history, a new integrated history. Um, I guess there was not a question. It comment. was not a question. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Yes. But um, one thing is that um, I want to point out is that when I bring people to see the exhibition, um, I always tell them, you know, these, these are all objects. They might be uh, 500 years old. But many of these ideas that are in this exhibition are very present today. And so you will understand where they come from. And that's why I also created a Spotify playlist with music, and you, you helped me with that, Renato. Um, because in popular culture, you see a lot of those ideas in films. Just think about the last Disney movie last year, The Jungle Cruise, all the stereotypes that are in, in, in there. Um, but let's bring it to the political arena. And you have Bolsonaro talking about the indigenous people being cannibals today. So that's why 
we're having these conversations, right? Um, and, and to understand where these ideas are coming from and how they were built and why and how we keep, you know, adding. And as we were talking in the morning, they, they change the meaning depending on the context. And now it's a particular context in Brazil. We have many examples of continuity of this. <laughs> we have many examples of this sort of continuity of the, this kind of colonial speech, right? But in my personal presentation, I, w I would like to emphasize other, other types of reinventions that was not captured, uh, was escaped the um, printmaker's eyes. And I think popular culture, it's a way to reinvent daily Americas. Um, my intention was just um, give an invitation or a provocation to search a little bit more this kind of manifestations in which reinventions of America is a practice and not a theory. Um, and for, to find it in other cultural contexts, as in Bahia we can say very clearly, um, just another comment um, after comment, the comment of Claire. Fernanda, do you want to add something? Oh, keep your thoughts with us for uh, Sunday. <laughs> More questions? We have, yeah, we have. Muito obrigada pela fala, pela fala, na verdade. Eu achei muito incrível, tipo, as análises que vocês propuseram. Um, eu gostaria de saber um pouco mais sobre essa questão de temporalidade, né, que que volta e meia, tipo, ficou aparecendo, tipo, nas falas. Eu achei muito interessante uh, na apresentação da Fernanda, quando ela comentou que The Nielsen estava lembrando de uma outra época, né, a época, tipo, das vozes dele. E ele falou que esse tempo não existe mais, não tem uma máquina do tempo para voltar para esse para esse época. Mas eu fiquei pensando, e talvez seja uma impressão só minha, mas eu pensei que, de algum jeito, a, né, a Fernando, você fez uma análise muito detalhada sobre essa questão de rasura, que a rasura que ele propõe, de algum jeito, propõe um tipo de time travel, de algum jeito. Tem uma ruptura de temporalidade que está pressuposta dentro desse gesto né, que o artista faz. E eu gostaria de saber um pouco mais, eu fiquei curioso né, em ouvir vocês, sobre essa questão de temporalidade, no sentido que talvez o trabalho do Danielson, o aspecto dele mais anticolonial, é o jeito que ele propõe uma ruptura na linearidade de, de tempo. Né, o jeito que a gente entende Uh, noções como progresso, desenvolvimento, uh, modernismo, etc. E uh, eu não sei se é uma, uma impressão minha, mas eu ficaria curioso tipo ouvir sobre isso e também como essa questão de uma ruptura de temporalidade, uma, uma imaginação de uma temporalidade mais plural, como isso poderia também conectar com a ideia de ancestralidade. Alex, can you translate yourself briefly? <laughs> Because they, they don't have the translation, oh, I think. Sorry, I, th I thought the translation was still. Uh, no, I'm just really interested in this question of temporality. I see the colonial project as connected to a linear idea of temporality. And I think that what the Nielsen does so well is really to almost propose a time machine through this gesture of the Hazura. And I'd just be really interested to hear you speak a little bit more about that and also how, whether you agree with me or not, and, and whether you think This may also connect to notions of ancestrality as well. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for, for your question. And I, um, I agree with you that 
uh, this procedure of erasure, um, it's um, it it um, complexifies the idea of a linear time uh, because it add add layers that are not uh, they are not um, superposed but they intertwine. So the idea of a continuous time of a uh, um, evolutionary time of a time that puts layers, uh, layer after layer, is challenged because you can see what is down, uh, up, and also when when you cannot see it, you know what it what you had there because when he's dealing with images that are so familiar, that are no, so present. Uh, and I guess this is the different, dif difference between other artists that are dealing with archival material, is that he's dealing with an archival that is everywhere, uh, that is part of what we uh, have as a visual culture. They're like omnipresent, as I told you. And so you know what is in the images, and he's pointing out not uh, to the things they are missing or they are misspelled, or but to the fact that you know those images, and when, when he erases or when he risks or uh, uh, when he changes, he's adding layers that are that. Uh, allow you to see what is uh, down underneath. And so that uh, connects with this idea of a temporality that is uh, plurivocal, that is uh, not one way, uh, just one way, but it, it goes back and forth and it has multiple layers and um, and um, and yes, uh, it, it it does it. I I think from that point I began to understand what the concept of ancestrality means to uh, in indigenous discourse, because it's not an idea of a past that is back in time and has no connection to the present, but it's you know it's. Uh, a past that that emerges in the presence, in this, as we could uh, relate to Walter Benjamin's idea of like uh, the, you know, the moment of danger that uh, truth emerges from uh, this relationship with the past. He's very Benjaminian in this sense, and he reads a lot of. He had read Walter Benjamin a lot. So. I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> okay, they're telling me one. Just if you want, yes. Oi, é, eu faço em português primeiro, depois tá. É. Pô, gente, valeu. Muito lindas as falas. Obrigado. Não, eu só queria perguntar ainda sobre um, essa complexidade uh, temporal e sobre um, um, essa, essa forma de presença que inclui múltiplas temporalidades. O que, que vocês acham, se essa é uma pergunta possível, que esses trabalhos dizem sobre o futuro? Can anybody, do you want to translate his question? Can you translate? Or you can translate yourself? Someone no? else can translate, okay. No, I'm just asking um, concerning uh, the complexity presence of, um, uh, of multiple pasts and multiple histories. So, uh, because you were talking about a presence that includes not only the present, but also the past present. In, yeah. So, uh, relating to that, if you can maybe think about what 
the Newsom's gestures might have to say about the future. I can sort this. Um, I, I can try to ask you by um, um, feeling a sensation that I had during my preparation of this paper. I realized that during all the process that we was occupied preparing the exhibition, thinking about each subject that constitute the process, the large process of inventions and reinventions of the Americas, we emphasized um, many, many times the suffering the murder, the violence, the violations, etc., etc. I mean, we talked about the time of the end, right? I tried um, in my presentation thinking about the time of the survivance. I mean, when we talk about reinventions of the Americas, maybe we can try to start to talk about um, strategies of survivance, party, feasts, music, dance, is not an alienation. It's a way to survive, right, in the violent context. So when we start to talk about, about survivance, we um, direct this borrow to the future. I think, well, I don't, I don't know, I think this, this, um, this is my, Opinion, and I think I I would like just to underscore the fact that mestizage, um, mestizaje, is can be um, viewed from this point of view of the erasing, but if we change a little bit the point of view as Tan Cummins uh, touch us this morning, we can maybe find some strategies for s make survive some ways of, um, of, of life. Um, I mean, if the, just, just uh, to add something very shortly, there is, when we were talking with Nilsson about his project for the exhibition, at the very beginning, and this is something that it, it didn't end up being part of the show because it was very complex to add, um, he thought about his interventions as the different days of the time. So the moment that the sun rises, the moment that is the middle of the day, and the sun is so bright that you cannot see, um, and when the sun leaves. And so the way that he was talking about his interventions was like that, like these different moments of the day. And when I was talking to him for the, for the audio tour that we recorded, um, he also talked about that. He also talked about the different days of the, uh, the different moments of the day and uh, relating that to the different historical moments. So he would say, when colonization happened, it was a dark moment. We didn't have light. Um, and he says, uh, at the very end of our conversation, he said, we're now in a different moment. We're starting to see the light. Okay, so if you ask me about what I think of what he thinks about the future, I would, I will get to that point, that he thinks that we're in a different moment and there's possibility of light. And let's end there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>